Hello, everybody. Um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever in the world you are. Um, I'm calling today from Washington, D.C., where I am a research associate at the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy. Uh, the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy, ITDP, is a global NGO, been around since 1985, um, and it advocates for and researches sustainable urban mobility in low and middle income countries worldwide. Um, but, and most of us at ITDP are more urban planners than data scientists. Uh, but this is a data science conference, so let's talk about the role of data science in urban planning. Now, sorry. Um, whenever we decide which data is worth gathering about cities or which indicators are worth measuring, we are normatively constructing society, in the words of Ben Green. If we collect and publish data about roadways and we don't collect and publish data about sidewalks, we are saying very loudly that cars are more important than people walking. And similarly, if we measure walkability in a way that's inaccurate or misleading, we set cities up to fail in providing walkability. So, you know, we're all familiar with the idea that careless data science can construct algorithms that have a racist or a sexist bias. And similarly, it's easy to accidentally build an algorithm that has a pro-car or anti-pedestrian bias. So to convince you that walkability is important, let's look at this little project in Chennai, India, very quickly. This is a project ITD has been working on for about a decade. Um, this was a lot more than just putting in new footpaths. It required a lot of design, engineering, you know, how are these footpaths going to be suited to the unique context of Southeast India, which is of course very different from the United States. Um, and you couldn't really understand this just by having a data set that says sidewalk, yes or no. You need a lot more detail about the presence or absence of obstructions, the connections to other modes of transport, etc. cetera. Um, but this project had a huge effect. It serves about 3 million people every day and because people shift from driving to walking, it prevents the emission of 3,000 tons of carbon dioxide per year. Um, it also saves the population of the city about 13 million US dollars per year. So walking is important. Um, I'm going to take a quick look next at three different platforms that have data about walking in cities, other people's platforms, not my own, not ITDP's. Um, I'm going to be pretty critical of these platforms in order to sort of convince you that we really need to take walking seriously. Don't take this the wrong way. I love all of these projects. I think they've made huge contributions to the world. And I'm really not an expert on any of them. So if I say something that you think is misinformed, please let me know in the chat. I'll correct myself. Um, so walk score. What, and sorry, and then I'll get around to talking about the pedestrians first project that ITDP itself has published. Um, so walk score is a proprietary algorithm measures walkability anywhere in the USA. You can see here that this address at Columbia Pike in Northern Virginia scores actually a very, very high walk score, 87, because it's close to a lot of destinations. But walk score doesn't take into account the width of the road or the speed of the cars. And so Columbia Pike is actually very, you know, dangerous and uncomfortable to walk on. But because this algorithm only thinks about destinations and not about the journey, this place gets a high walk score. So if you used walk score in urban planning, you might end up incentivizing the creation of more places like this. So if you have an algorithm that purports to talk about walkability, but doesn't measure it in a really co comprehensive way, you're going to get misleading results. Um, next, Maple area. Um, this is an amazing project. This is the kind of thing that if I, you know, if you told me it existed, I wouldn't believe you. And then it shows up and it's real and it's just incredible to me. Um, so Mapillary, it's a project done by Facebook. It's sort of an open source, crowdsourced Google Street View plus computer vision object recognition of street features. So I don't have the computer vision up right now, but you know, the computer vision would be able to identify this car in the image on the right. It would be able to identify the lane markings, signs, probably pull out this building in the right. Um, and Mapillary is based on user uploaded imagery taken while walking, cycling, or driving. But because you know the vast, vast majority of their imagery is from driving, the 
computer vision algorithms are trained to see the world from the perspective of a car, which makes it easier for urban planners to use these algorithms to build more roads for cars and does not facilitate, and, and sorry, and also the sidewalk imagery doesn't have a particular tag that lets you pull it out. Um, and so it's, it's more difficult to use mapillary to focus on walkability than it is to focus on problems with driving. Um, of course, mapillary has also been used for some really incredible bicycle advocacy, especially in Ottawa, um, and for a lot of problems with walkability as well. So mapillary is an amazing project, but I'm just trying to make the point that if we assume that the default perspective is the perspective of a car, we're going to not only miss a lot of detail, but we're going to perpetuate a car-centric urban planning system. OpenStreetMap. Um, here's an example from my neighborhood in DC. Uh, this is you know, a dense, very highly educated neighborhood. And so we'd expect good OpenStreetMap data. And in fact, you know, the buildings are all laid out perfectly. All of these details, all of these names and addresses, all the parking areas and the alleyways are tagged impeccably. Um, but you'll notice that even in DuPont Circle, Washington, D.C., the sidewalks are tagged very inconsistently. They're tagged south of R Street, but not north of it. This sidewalk on next to 18th Street Northwest appears to just dead end, when in reality, of course, the sidewalk continues. Um, different intersections are tagged in different ways. So overall, as of now, OpenStreetMap pedestrian data is noise. You cannot use it practically um, around the world. And I think this is such a tragedy, right? Because OpenStreetMap is, as far as I see it, probably the only platform that really could be a true global data set for walking. Um, and so if we, you know, as data scientists, believe that walkability is as important as cars, we have a responsibility to improve our data sets for walking, to measure walking as much, measure walkability and walking as much as we can. The Open Sidewalks Project from the University of Washington is a great, great way of getting started on this. They've, you know, collected extremely detailed data in a few neighborhoods. It's incredible. We need to find a way to scale this up to the whole world. Um, I promised I'd mention what ITDP has done so far, and I've only got a couple of minutes. So, um, Pedestrians First is a website that we published uh, about a year ago. It includes self-survey tools for neighborhoods and streets and transit systems so that you can sort of go out into your street and figure out what matters for walkability there. It also includes the orange tool here, the View City Measurements tool, which we used data from OpenStreetMap and from the European Commission, Global Open Data, to measure indicators of walkability geospatially for about a thousand urban areas all around the globe. Um, I encourage you, open it up right now, pedestriansfirst.itdp.org, and just plug in whatever city you care about. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, and any suggestions you have. Um, so what are we looking for? Um, not just what are we at ITDP looking for, but what do we believe the whole world needs to have better data on walkability? Ways of measuring footpath quality, including crosswalks and curb cuts. Um, the Tasker Center, the Open Street, Open Sidewalks, sorry, project is really getting a great start on this. Um, but we need it globally, and we need it consistently. Um, we need data on traffic speeds and volumes. Right now, it's possible to purchase this data from a number of sources, but if it can be made open, of course, a street with fewer cars or slower cars is a much safer street for people walking. Um, Perhaps most importantly, we need really nuanced, sensitive routing engines for walking that take into account or can be configured to take into account the subjective experience of walkability. You know, obstructions slow you down, crossing a wide road slows you down. Uh, engines like um, Open Trip Planner and R5 by Conveil are terrific. They're very impressive. They're not quite configurable enough to yet to really... Um, measure walking as it is actually done. And finally, I don't even know how to begin doing this, but we need data on walking volumes and routes to help us understand people's route choice as they walk through the city. So 
this is huge. I mean, this is the whole world. This is all of cities and so many billions of people um, walk every day. And but I think that our technology um, can really make the difference. Um, and the decisions that we as data scientists make will influence how cities are built for decades to come. Um, thank you so much for your time today. Just a minute or two for questions, but please give me an email. That's Taylor Rich, they, them, gender neutral pronouns, taylor.reich at itdp.org. Um, I look forward to hearing from you. Awesome. Thank you, Taylor, for uh, your presentation there. It makes you think about the cities you live within and you're like, is it really walkable? Are there things that could be different? Kind of make you question things that maybe you haven't before. So we, we do have time for a couple of questions. And one in the chat is, what are some use cases for walkability? And it would be interesting to understand as well, use cases maybe or examples of how cities have be been made more accessible as a result of these tools. Absolutely. Um, so the thing about walkability, as you pointed out, right, it's the sort of thing you often take for granted um, and th perhaps think that you have an intuitive understanding of, but really there's a whole academic literature on walkability and there's the experience of lots of professionals worldwide that show that that intuition's often right, but there are so many things that matter for walkability and the pedestrians first tools really try and step out one by one what all those different things that measure for walkability are. So if you want to learn more about walkability, that website's a great place to start. Um, I think that that example of the footpaths in Chennai is a really good example. You know, the Chennai government was really convinced that they had to invest in walkability. They had to allocate funding to walkability just like they allocate funding to cars. And it helps millions of people get around every day, um, improves air quality, improves, increases public health. Absolutely. What are some alternative ways to measure walkability? There's a there's a lot on this. There's a lot of different ways. Um, and I, you know, I'd be the first to say that anything you can do with a computer is just going to be the first step to really understand walkability. You need to have someone on the ground observing people. Um, I think his name is Jan Gell in Copenhagen. Has been working on this for decades. They've established sort of a set of tools, things that you can have on your cell phone or print out on a clipboard and go out and, um, you know, count people and count people of different ages and genders and what activities they're doing. Are they sitting? Are they walking? Are they playing, eating? Um, and you can learn a lot about a neighborhood or a street with those kinds of tools. Awesome. Thank you. I think we have time for at least a couple more questions. So besides walkability for pedestrians, how can we tie this to overall sustainability as in access to public transportation and reducing CO2 emissions? Yeah, of course. Um, so I think there's a lot to be said simply for, I mean, this is, this is a great question. This is what I spend all of my days working on. Um, I think that it's, so part of the reason why routing engines are something I called out in that last slide there is that they, so I'm gonna go back to that slide if I can. Um, I call that routing engines because they're really key for um, measuring access to destinations. Um, that's really what matters to people in cities is can they get where they want to go? And if we can make it possible for people to get to their jobs or to the market or to their friends' houses easier by walking and transit than by driving, then people are going to walk and take transit. Uh, instead of driving. And, you know, the number one way to reduce carbon emissions around the world is going to be by getting people out of their cars and onto buses, bicycles, and in their walking in their shoes. Um, and in order to make that happen, we need to be able to measure our progress toward it. And in order to measure our progress toward it, we need these ways, these things that will help us measure walkability. Awesome. And then... Someone asked, so walkability is such a nice ga gauge of grading locations. Are these algorithms, methodologies, adaptable or applicable to locations outside the US? Um, I think you touched on that. So if you could expand on that, and if not, what is advice on starting on that endeavor if you're looking globally? Of course. Um, so, you know, I, I feel very happy to work for ICDP, an organization that's focused on the rest of the world first and then the US second, um, because, 
so much of these problems are even more pressing in the rest of the world that's growing so much more quickly. Um, so Pedestrians First, the website that we published, um, which if, Eliana, if you could put the link in the chat, I'd really appreciate it or someone could. Um, that includes measurements. They're, they're very basic indicators, not really at the level that I've been talking about in this talk, but what we can do with what we have in OSM. Um, and that's for a thousand cities around the whole world. Um, it is really intended to work well in, especially middle income countries, Latin America, the Middle East. Um, OSM data in a lot of very poor countries just isn't good enough to even start working with. Um, but, but yes, this kind of, um, yeah, I think that's, that's all I can say right now in a minute or two. Fair enough. Um, could you elaborate on the car-free places metric? Looking at Vienna, it seems to classify large swaths of the area as car-free, which is unfortunately just not true. Right. Um, thanks for asking this, Anita. That can, can be a bit of a confusing one. Um, so that one takes anything in OpenStreetMap that's tagged as being for pedestrians only and puts a 100 meter buffer around it. Again, this is really intended to work best in middle income countries, a lot of Europe. For example, you'll have just ordinary sidewalks tagged as car-free places, which kind of misleads the algorithm a little bit. Um, and I think really just shows the need for more nuanced tagging in OpenStreetMap of, you know, is this a sidewalk? Is it a footpath, a greenway? What is this? Awesome. Thank you for answering all the questions um, or all the questions that I posed. There are actually some left over in the Q&A if you did want to.